when you start talking about chastisement, many times people think you're a little kooky, a little bit wacko. What do you mean, chastisement? Uh, you get the impression sometimes that the mainstream would not agree with that idea that God will be punishing the earth. And in order to dispel that a little bit, I, I want to just mention that in the years that I've worked with our organization, Tradition, Family, and Property, one of the things, one of the functions that I've done is fathom a statue custodian, which means I take, we take a big statue of Our Lady and we travel around and go into different houses and promote the Fatima message. We talk about why Fatima is important. Those of you who were here at my last talk, it was about the Fatima messages. So while I was doing that, of course, one of the, the first things uh, we always try to get across, and we mention, is that the message of Fatima predicts that there will be a chastisement coming upon mankind. Now, when I was doing this work, I traveled this country from end to end, from top to bottom. Uh, and during the two years that I was doing there, I went into more than a thousand homes to spread Our Lady's Fatima message. We were doing three visits a day. It was a very rigorous schedule. So I got a pretty good idea of a very nice cross-section of the country. You know, what it is that the common people think. And I want to make a mention that these were not hand-picked people that we were visiting. Uh, as the program, our Fatima home visitation thing advanced, we developed better ways to classify people and to understand the kind of people that would like a visit of the Fatima statue. But when we got started at the beginning, it was basically any name and phone number we got a hold of, we'd go bring the statue into their house and visit them. So during this time, I visited a lot of people that were neither conservative nor pious. Literally, I visited Buddhists, schismatics, Protestants, I met abortionists, I met homosexual activists, you name it. I gave the presentation to false visionaries, crazy cats, everything. Of course, I visited a lot of good people also. It wasn't all, it wasn't all negative. But one thing I found very interesting, in those two years when I was dedicated to that work, not once did I have someone challenge me on the notion that the world is headed to, towards a chastisement. That God is not going to allow himself to be mocked forever. And I'm not saying that everybody already believed in it, everybody necessarily accepted it once I explained it, but the notion was on such firm ground that nobody challenged me to the face on that point. I got challenged on almost every other part of my presentation. So I think there is a prevailing thought in the world amongst people that, yeah, we have sinned as a society, we've sinned greatly, and we should expect at some point that God will intervene. Just to reinforce this, I want to mention uh, that when I was researching this talk, I stumbled across a discussion board on MSNBC. And to start this discussion, a very simple question was posed. Do you think that we are living through a divine chastisement? That was put up. And over the next week, a full 400 exchanges took place revolving around this this topic. It was very interesting to read it because there were a few believers, you can imagine on a, a place like MSNBC, there were a few believers defending the idea and there were maybe 30 or 40 radical atheists, anti-Christians who were fighting them on this idea. So to get you um, to have a little bit of a feeling of how this discussed, I want to read for you a couple of the comments that the believers, the people who believed in divine chastisement wrote. Because I want you to see how these are normal people. They're very right thinking, they're very logical. First one, many Christians have warned for years that the sinfulness of our culture would eventually catch up to us. That sooner or later, the slippery slope would manifest itself through painful situations for our nation. Is it possible that we are seeing this now? Consider these points. Multiple wars, and wars are often seen as divine punishment for sin. St. Augustine actually teaches that, that war is one of the means that God uses to punish the world for sinfulness. Record numbers of tornadoes, hurricanes wreaking havoc on a fairly regular basis, banks collapsing, housing collapsing, outrageous unemployment rates, ga gas prices over $4 a gallon, jobs shifting overseas, huge companies folding, potential future problems with Russia, 
Potential future problems with Iran. China and India are taking major steps towards economic superiority in the world. Major airlines are on the brink of destruction. The list is fairly endless, and all of that has happened in mere years, not decades or centuries. Very interesting. Another comment. Doesn't it seem like we're seeing an ever-increasing intensity in our national woes? One has a feeling that this is just the beginning, and if that's true, then the Industrial Revolution might look like heaven in comparison. My personal favorite was uh, one poster who went through all of the different calamities we're seeing in society, all these difficulties, and then he said this. Frankly, however, I don't think all these past and present troubles are, quote, the divine chastisement. And then in all caps, those are merely wake-up calls. He continued, either America truly re uh, repents and turns away from her sins and turns back to God and to God's word as she has done in the past. And yes, that's going to make a lot of people upset. Mm -hmm. Or are we all going to find out just what those two little strange words mean? Divine chastisement. So once again, I wanted to read these. These are very right-thinking people. These are not wackos. It's not some uh, evangelical preacher screaming from a pulpit about the judgment of God being at hand. These are very intelligent, normal, reasonable people who see something very scary coming down the pipeline. So this brings me into my lecture this morning. Uh, as many of you uh, certainly read on your invitations, my talk is titled, The Coming Chastisement. Uh, an expression of God's justice and His mercy. And it's aimed at being an introduction to one of the central pillars of the TFP's thought, of the thought of tradition, family, and property. And it is the belief that, that there is a cataclysmic punishment that's coming on the earth. Now I say that's one of the central pillars of TFP thought because it's in hopes of a coming chastisement that we put our hopes of the coming uh, victory of the church over the errors of the modern world. It's a very simple thing. Um, and we're going to go through this more as the talk goes along. Now, I know several of us here already believe in this coming chastisement. But as Americans, we tend to be skeptical even of our most strongly held beliefs. So even if you already believe this chastisement is coming, uh, I think it's very good for us to analyze a little bit the reasons why we think this chastisement is coming. So with that in mind, my, my talk is going to consist of three easy points. The first point I'm going to deal with is why it's reasonable to expect the coming chastisement. The second thing I'm going to talk about is what are the historic precedents of divine punishments that have fallen on the earth? How many times have God, has God already come and punished the earth? The third point will be what have the recognized mystics of the church had to say about what we can expect, expect to take place during this chastisement? Now, is that clear? Uh, before we get on, does anyone have any questions or that they'd like to, to raise? Um, you said that the divine chastisement is an act of God, God's mercy. Yes. We're going to talk about that a little bit. I'm glad you caught that. It's an act of justice, but also of mercy. And just in a nutshell, uh, we're going to discuss this later, but just in a nutshell, the idea is this, that it is not merciful to allow mankind to continue sinning and destroying itself. Oh. And if the only means to turn society around is that God punishes the world, that punishment is an act of mercy. Just like a parent punishing the child who's going to get himself into trouble if he keeps going the way he is, is an act of justice, but also of mercy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. So, let's take a, a closer look at some of the arguments that show how reasonable it is to believe in a coming chastisement. And I came up with four arguments to demonstrate this. The first argument is based on the sinfulness of the world today. And I don't think we need to look any further than the front page of any newspaper uh, from any city in America to see how society is literally unraveling from its very foundations because of its sinfulness. Morality is breaking down. And morality is the foundation upon which any society exists. If you don't have a moral code in society, people can't live together in harmony, plain and simple. So, like I said, you go to the, the front page of any newspaper, you can see this. I'm going to bring up just a couple of examples that will bring this to real, but I'm not going to belabor this point very much. 
Because I think we all already have a million examples of this sinfulness in society that we could bring up. So I'm going to bring up just a couple examples. The first example I think is very obvious is the whole idea of the fight for traditional marriage. That's a fight that the TFP has been very involved in. And that fight is an absurd fight. Why do I say it's absurd? It's absurd to even say traditional marriage. Because traditional marriage, there's only one marriage. There's not a traditional and a non-traditional marriage. The very concept that an illegit, uh, illicit, illegitimate homosexual union can somehow be recognized on par with the sacrament of the church, with the uniting of two people for the beginning of a family, that very notion is outrageous, and that's spread throughout society. And may I say something? Sure. It was even put to a proposition, vote by the people, in one majority. Twice. Yeah. Twice. And it's just... And they still crammed it through. Yeah. But you see, many, many people are accepting this notion. It's an absurdity. That's one notion of sinfulness, and that's a notion that's very important because one thing we know if we study history is that that's one sin, homosexuality, that God does not tolerate, does not tolerate very long. Another example of this is recent legislation that's been going on here in California. Uh, Jerry Brown, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, the law he recently so, uh, signed concerning uh, the whole gender identity thing. Right now in the state of California, it is illegal for school teachers to prevent a boy who thinks he's a girl from using the girls restroom in our schools. It's illegal for him to prevent that boy from getting changed in the world, the girls locker room. That's, can you even imagine? Uh, similarly, uh, you're all familiar with the law on reparative therapy. There are very effective means for people who, who suffer from the inclination of homosexuality. There are many psychological means to turn that around. They're very effective. At least a third of people who enter into this therapy are cured from their problem, their vice of homosexuality. We have a law in the state of California that makes it illegal for a minor with the consent of his parents to undergo such treatment. Think about that for just a second. It's legal for a boy, a minor boy, to go into a doctor and say, I want you to change me into a girl. That's legal. But somebody who's struggling with horrible temptations towards homosexuality cannot go to a doctor and say, please help me. This is the sinfulness of the world that I'm talking about. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. Now add to this the reality that since the infamous Roe versus Wade decision, 1973, 48 million pre-born children have been legally slaughtered in their mother's womb right here in America. We add to that crisis in the church, blasphemy, disregard for private property, decaying right, uh, respect for the elders, de degenerating fashions. You, you can't even walk on the streets anymore. It's practically an occasion of sin because of the way fashions have been degraded. Divorce, promiscuity, radical fe feminism, the list could go on and on and on. But like I said, I don't want to belabor that point too much because I think you're all very familiar with the, the sinfulness of our world. So due to this sinfulness, it's very reasonable to expect God to punish the world. This then is the first argument that I put forth. Now the second argument is going to take some, uh, it's going to be a little bit abstract and it's going to be a little more complicated. So you're going to have to put your thinking caps on for a little bit. But, but it's a very important issue to discuss. The second argument deals with the fact that God is in absolute control of everything that takes place. If some suffering comes to the world, it's because God ordained it or permits it. Because God is capable of stopping those things. So if God is visiting the world with suffering, it's because God wants to punish mankind. So all the suffering you see in society today in some way pass through the hands of God, and God uses those things in order to punish mankind. So if God is already chastising the world, my second argument is that God, as the sinfulness increases, it would stand to reason that the chastisements will increase also. Now, in order to understand this notion that God, in fact, is in charge, and God is, in fact, bringing these sufferings to the earth, we have to understand two attributes of God that we're going to discuss here. And both of these attributes can be proven through logic. We don't have to accept them on, on faith. 
The first attribute is that God is omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. God can do all things. The second attribute is he's omniscient, which means God knows all things. He has infinite wisdom, and he knows everything. Okay, so let's get into this a little bit. Uh, the Catechism of the Council of Trent actually explains this very well. And uh, I taught from that for several years, so I'm going to be uh, basing myself primarily on what it says there, St. Robert Bellarmine. So the first idea, God is omnipotent, how do we know that? Through just reason alone. It's very simple. Because God created everything. Now creating something is not what human beings do. Human beings take the things that God created and transform them into something else. God created everything from absolutely nothing. And the capacity to bring something out of nothingness requires infinite power. You cannot limit the power of a being that can take something from nothing. It's like dividing by zero, if we've got anybody who's involved in mathematics here. So the being that calls forth things from absolute nothingness is capable of transforming those things that he called forth in any way he sees fit. Is that clear? Very obvious, very reasonable. How about omniscient? How do we know that God is infinitely wise and that he knows all things. And in order to understand this, you have to understand that in any being, their power, the amount of power that they have, has to be in balance to the amount of wisdom they have to use that power. If not, you have a monstrosity. I used to use a funny example when I was teaching catechism on this, and that is the example of a baby. Take a two-year-old. Two-year-olds have very limited wisdom, and they have, thanks be to God, very limited power. So they're in balance, it's not a monstrosity. Take that two-year-old and give him the capacity to launch a nuclear weapon anywhere in the world. What would happen? We would have a monstrosity. We, we would have a monstrosity because we'd have a being whose wisdom, whose knowledge is totally out of proportion to their power. He doesn't have the wisdom to direct such massive power, and every time he got hungry, we'd lose a couple cities. Plain and simple. That's a monstrosity. We know that God is not a monstrosity because he's done everything with order, with balance, with beauty, all of creation. Now, the only type of intellect that can balance out a being with infinite power is what kind of intellect? An infinite intellect. If you have infinite power, you have to have infinite intellect. Therefore, God knows all things. He is infinitely wisdom, and He's infinitely powerful. Is that clear? Okay, let's take it a step further then. What would you say about a being who is infinitely wise, infinitely powerful, so he has the wisdom to see how best to intervene and make sure that his creation is going the way he wants it to, he knows the best way, has infinite power to make that a reality and doesn't use that power to guide creation and to guide society. We'd say that would be a very cruel being. Because just like I have an obligation with my wisdom that's superior to the wisdom of a two-year-old, just like I have an obligation to guard that two-year-old from things that could harm him. If he's running towards a busy street, unless I'm cruel, I've got to stop him from getting hit by a car. If he reaches for a hot pan on the stove, I need to stop him from doing that. Because I have an obligation to use my wisdom to guide that two-year-old. It's the same thing with God and his creation. He has the wisdom. He has the power. Therefore, since he's not cruel, he has the obligation to guide us in a wise way. Okay, so that then is the second argument that I want to put forth, that God is all-powerful. He guides society. He guides all aspects of his creation. And therefore, if there's suffering in the world, if there are catastrophes, if there's wars, if there's natural disasters, God allows those things to happen. He has the power to change it. He ordains them. What is the reason he ordains them? Like a good father, he ordains them in order to punish and correct us. So God is already, every time you see a catastrophe, something of that nature, <clears throat> it's God's way of already giving punishment to this earth, already chastising society. So if God is already chastising, 
it's very reasonable to expect that those chastisements will continue and get worse as the sinfulness of society continues. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. Third argument that I'm going to uh, I'm going to put forth is that if we sit here for a second and we think about all the factors that would make up a divine chastisement, all the aspects of what chastisement would mean, we will see that we are already in the throes of a great chastisement. We are being chastised already. And to illustrate that, let's think about that. What is, what are these notions? What are the um, manifestations of a chastisement that you can imagine? Economic breakdown. Breakdown of society. Social breakdown. Radical immorality. Persecutions of the good. These are all what we would imagine a chastisement to be. We're already experiencing these things. These chastisements are already coming. We can only expect in the future that they will continue. So let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, first of all, let's talk about economic breakdown. Are we experiencing that? Yes. I think it's pretty obvious we are. We don't have to go into many details about that. I mean, there's no one in their right mind who is very optimistic about the future of our economy right now. Um, and we live this every day. This is a reality. What about societal breakdown? Breakdown of, of the interaction between human beings. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of how the world society is breaking down, it's very common in some places in the world. One I'm going to mention in particular is Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. It's one of the worst places for drug, drug trafficking in the world. Several times, this happened just recently, uh, a few months ago, again, Several times the police have tried to intervene in riots and things by putting a helicopter in the sky to, foresee what, to oversee what's going on. Several times the drug lords have shot those helicopters out of the sky with anti-aircraft weaponry. That's the breakdown of society that I'm talking about. Um, and like I said, this takes place all the time. We see all the many different types of, of murder all these strange murders, um, cannibalistic murders, homosexual murders, all of these things that are taking place are the breakdown of society. It's bringing chastisement on us. Uh, we also see this breakdown in the after effects of disasters like Hurricane Katrina. I don't know if you all remember what took place after that. We're going to talk about that a little bit more afterwards. But once the coercive power to restrain people in New Orleans was removed, People resorted to absolute barbarism. They were killing each other in the streets. Even the ambulances trying to help sick people, even the food trucks that were bringing food to starving people were being shot at. That's societal breakdown. Um, so I, I think, I think that, that, that shows how our society as a whole is breaking down from the very foundation. Um, we see also a tremendous escalation in natural disasters in the world. Unfortunately, I don't have the chart with me, but if you look, um, there have been many charts to show the increase of natural disasters in society, in the world. It goes up almost vertical. We're seeing increasing natural disasters. So that is the third argument that I want to put for on why it's reasonable to accept this, expect this chastisement. The world has already started to slip headlong into a major uh, chastisement. All of the factors we would uh, expect from a chastisement are already taking place. Will they get worse or will they get better? It's, very, it's a question that, that should be on our minds. The fourth and final reasonable argument I want to put forth to show um, that we should expect a chastisement is that anything shy of a major worldwide catastrophe is insufficient to put the world back on, on its right tracks. Now, then, that is why, um, and this gets in a little bit to your question earlier, why can we say that chastisements are, are of God, are an expression of God's justice, but also His mercy? It's because God is a good Father. In His chastisements, He always has the solution for the errors that caused the chastisement in the first place. Just like a parent doesn't chastise the son just to get back at him, but that chastisement contains within it the way to put the sun back on tracks. So God's chastisements are coming to us as, an, as a mercy to change us. The fourth uh, thing I want to talk about is that 
these chastisements, plainly and simply, have not been enough. It's going to take something major to turn us around. And to make you understand that, I want to bring some examples up. Um, the first example I'd like to bring up about this is the tsunami in 2004. Does everybody remember that? Worst, worst natural disaster in history. 225,000 people died in that. And that tsunami was broadcast throughout the entire world. Everybody knew what happened. It was on television screens, on newspapers, in magazines, on the internet. Everybody saw the effects of that, of that tsunami. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that era, area in Indonesia was known throughout the world for its sinfulness. Prostitution, nude beaches, child pornography, homosexuality were all rampant throughout that section of, of Indonesia. That's why people went there in order to, uh, that's why people went there, was to engage in all these terrible things. Well, since this terrible tsunami came, since people throughout the world saw it, you'd expect a result of that to be people turning back to God, doing penance, doing some kind of, of repentance, uh, starting to pray. We didn't see that. We didn't see that at all. Yeah. We didn't see that anywhere in the world. Worst of all, we didn't even see that in Indonesia. Immediately after that, people went right back to doing all the terrible things they were doing before. So much so, I read an article at the time in 2004 that was describing that in the aftermath of the tsunami, a mere days after it took place, people were back on the beaches doing everything a mere hundred yards away from where bodies were rotting, dead bodies. People went right back into the types of pleasure that caused the chastisement in the first place. And this was broadcast. Um, I was reading a travel journal. Uh, around that time also that was written by a British uh, tourism writer named Darren Cronian. And he wrote an article called The Effects of the Asian Tsunami on Tourism. And I want to read for you what he wrote regarding this. Quote, A tsunami struck out of nowhere going down in history as the most devastating earthquake, killing over 200,000 people. The coasts of Southeast Asia had been building uh, popularity with Europeans when this occurred. Understandably so, tourism dwindled down after this, but not for long. Fortunately, the travel industry has been working hard since the tsunami to regain their visitors. They began to encourage the government to help them assure travelers that this tsunami was an isolated event, something that just does not happen. There was one good thing that came out of this tragedy. With all the media coverage on the tsunami, more people became aware of this ideal vacation destination. Fortunately for everyone, tourists have begun to realize that a tsunami of this magnitude is rare, something that happens maybe once every hundred years, and they are not letting it scare them away from enjoying a piece of paradise. Now when he talks about enjoying a piece of paradise, do you think tourists were going there to enjoy the beauties of God's creation. Their idea of paradise is, once again, partaking in all those things that are illegal in other parts of the world, child prostitution, pornography, all of these things that, that were taking place there. Um, another example of that is Hurricane Katrina. We're going to get into that later. I'm not going to really build that up. But just noticing these things, all of these chastisements are not turning people to repent. So we can clearly see localized catastrophes, regardless of how terrible they are, are not sufficient to convert mankind. What is necessary is a major widespread chastisement that will finally wake up mankind and put it on its right tracks. So this is the end of the first part of my talk. I know this was the most difficult intellectually, the most tiring, but the rest of it is going to be a lot easier. So, so um, just to put things in order, I want to just summarize the four arguments that I gave, gave again to you all. The first argument I gave that, I, uh, that shows that it's reasonable to accept a chastisement is because of man's sinfulness that has reached proportions unheard of. Second reason is that God controls everything and therefore he commonly makes use of natural occurrences to punish mankind. So it's reasonable to suppose that if God is already punishing mankind for its sinfulness, he will continue to do so.
Third reason is if you analyze the factors that make up a chastisement, you see we're already slipping into a great chastisement. And the last argument is that localized chastisements have not been effective in fulfilling the purpose for which God punishes mankind. That is to turn men around, set them back on the right track, and save their souls. So those are the first, uh, the first four, four arguments. Does anyone have any questions before we go on? Or comments? Is that clear to everybody? Okay, good. Well, as you all remember, as I mentioned, the second point of my talk is going to be that I'm going to discuss the historic precedents, the times in which God has already, already punished. And this will give us a notion, once again, that God does punish mankind for sinfulness. And so I'm going to use historic examples here. And in order to make it even, even more convincing, I'm not going to use any examples from the Old Testament at all. We know that after the redemption, God visit, treats the earth with much more mercy than he did before. And I'm not discounting the Old Testament chastisements. I just think it's more convincing if we talk about New Testament, modern chastisements. It'll be much uh, easier for us to relate to them. Okay, the first example of a chastisement I already gave, it was the tsunami uh, that took place uh, the day after Christmas in 2004. Next example uh, is Hurricane Katrina, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this. Um, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans in 2005. Um, why do I say that that was a chastisement? Why do I think that that was a punishment that God was giving here? Well, first of all, New Orleans, which suffered far worse than any other place during that hurricane, was the nation's homosexual capital. There were more homosexuals in New Orleans than even in San Francisco, per capita. The second thing uh, that I want to mention is that it also had the country's highest murder rate. In addition to that, how many people here have visited New Orleans before? A few, a few have many years ago. If you go in New Orleans, I lived in Louisiana for a little over a year, you go to New Orleans and you see practitioners of black magic everywhere. There are palm readers on the street, there are tarot card readers, all of these weird people dabbling in black magic. Um, perhaps most significant of the, the sinfulness of New Orleans is an event that uh, was started uh, back in 1972. And the event is called Southern Decadence. Has anybody heard of that? Southern, that parade? Decadence. Southern Decadence. Southern Decadence is an event intended primarily for homosexual men. And it has expanded since its beginning to include one to three hundred thousand participants each year. Uh, it's been informally dubbed as the Gay Mardi Gras. Um, it's interesting to note that the first Southern Decadence Parade took place in New Orleans uh, one month after the miraculous statue of Our Lady of Fatima wept in the city of New Orleans. What year was that? It was 1972. She wept in New Orleans. It's also the same uh, right before the legalization of abortion in this country. This obviously is a replica of this statue. This is not the one that wept. But, but it's very well reported. Uh, the Pilgrim, International Pilgrim Virgin of Our Lady of Fatima wept more than 20 times in New Orleans in 1972. So this event took place, the first one was started one month afterwards. What exactly goes on there? Well, just to give you an idea of the sinfulness of this event, I'm going to read for you an excerpt from a New Orleans tourist website that was advertising the event. And I apologize for reading something so disgusting, but I normally wouldn't do that especially with ladies present, but the fact of the matter is we need to open our eyes and see the world in which we live. So the, um, I'm going to read for you. Now, remember, this is from a tourist website. This is trying to bring people to this event. Quote, leave your prudish friends and family at home. Oh, wow. Parades and nonstop parties aside, Southern Decadence may be most famous or infamous for the displays of naked flesh which characterize the event. The atmosphere of Southern decadence has stayed true to its name and public displays of sexuality are pretty much everywhere you look. Like I said, you might want to leave your more prudish friends and family at home. Date, August 31st to September 5th, 2005. 
that event was supposed to start on August 31st. Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans on August 23rd, one week before the event was supposed to take place. The result was that it was officially canceled. Although a few diehard homosexual activists took to the streets and engaged in the same terrible behavior right when they were surrounded by all the death and the destruction of the, of the hurricane. Now in spite of that, next year's event that was titled Southern Decadence Rebirth attracted near normal sized crowds. So they went right back and started doing it again. Incidentally, in 2008, Hurricane Gustav hit the coast of New Orleans in the middle of that year's parade and forced it to be canceled halfway through. You'd think that the participants would eventually get the hint. They're not. It still goes on. Look it up on the internet. You'll find this year's uh, parade is as big as ever. Well, my opinion, these details leave very little doubt that Katrina and Gustav were at least a warning or a forecast of greater catastrophes that loom on the horizon. Now, just to put things in perspective, let's remember what took place during Hurricane, hurricane Katrina. Hurricane Katrina is currently the seventh most powerful hurricane that has ever been recorded. It had sustained winds of 175 miles per hour. A 13-foot storm surge broke the levees in New Orleans, and 80% of the city was flooded with water that lingered there for weeks. Once the storm stopped, anarchy began to reign in the streets. Stores were looted by criminals and police officers alike. We saw videos of police officers in the stores looting with everyone else. A full third of the city's police officers abandoned their posts and fled. Um, once uh, this thing took place, gangs took control of the street. Shootouts became common. Uh, rapes were all over the place. Violence reached the point that even emergency vehicles, as I mentioned, were being shot at when they were trying to take sick people out of the city. Now, violence reached such a, a crescendo, and the, the police officers were so incapable of restoring order, uh, Governor Kathleen Blanco called in the military. I, uh, I actually, the military put things into order very, very quickly. I'm personal friends with a gentleman in Louisiana that knows a New Orleans police officer who was there when this took place. And he said when the military came in, the first thing they did was said, all the reporters out. They expelled all the reporters so nobody would know what happened, and they went in there and they started shooting people. Plain and simple. That sounds terrible, but it was the only way. Things were so out of control, it was the only way they could restore order in the streets of New Orleans. Um, the evacuation attempts uh, throughout this whole thing were, were hindered by the fact that the roads going in and out of the city were damaged and they were covered with dead bodies. The dead bodies were, were exposed so much that many of them were unidentifiable and the disaster was over. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, what I've described can be seen as a microcosm of what could easily take place on a worldwide scale. Think of all the major cities. Fire the police force of Los Angeles tomorrow and see what happens to Los Angeles. This is very real. Another example of chastisement that came to the world uh, can be found in the Colombian city of Armero. Has anyone here heard of Armero? It's an extraordinary story. And it starts all the way back in 1948. So in 1948, uh, a populist presidential candidate was shot in the streets and riots broke out throughout the country. These riots were led by a communist group that's called the Bogotazo, because it was begun in Bogota, Colombia. Just as a passing note, the uh, communist guerrillas in Colombia, the FARC, uh, got their origins from this Bogota Bogotazo. So the riots spread throughout the whole country, and they reached the town of Armero in central Colombia. Now, many people were killed and, and wounded in these riots. And in face of all this, the local parish priest wanted to offer the sacraments to the people that were dying. So he asked police protection from the city mayor so that he could continue to at least give the sacraments to the people that were dying. And the mayor refused to give him any kind of protection whatsoever. So realizing how desperate his situation was, first thing he did was what a good priest would do. He took the blessed sacrament out of the church and stored it in a local convent. Very shortly after that, 
it was wise that he did that because very shortly after that, the revolutionaries broke into the church, desecrated all the statues, and were, were rapidly looking for the Blessed Sacrament to desecrate as well. Um, so after putting the Blessed Sacrament in safekeeping, this priest turned around and he went back into all the chaos, even without police protection, to continue offering the last sacraments, offering confession. And when he did that, um, he um, got into, he became the center of the revolutionaries' anger. They started to chase him through the streets. To seek solace, he went into a travel agency and tried to lock the door behind him. They broke into the travel agency, drug the priest out onto the street and made a circle around him. And they started beating him with the flats of their machetes. They were bruising him up, breaking bones and whatnot, and things went to the next level, as you can imagine, and they started screaming, no, don't hit him with the flats, hit him with the edges. And they started to hack at him. They broke his neck first. He was completely paralyzed. There's nothing he could do, and they started to, to literally mutilate the priest. Um, as he died, he was stripped and brutally, brutally uh, mutilated. What's satanic about it was these revolutionaries were being followed by a group of prostitutes. And just to show you how satanic this event was, they were taking the intestines of the, of the priest and wearing them around their neck like necklaces as they danced in the streets. Um, the priest's body was then hooked to a truck and drugged throughout the, the city streets and dumped into a pool of water where it was left for days until one family had the courage to go out there, retrieve the body, and give it proper burial. It's interesting that after days of exposure to the elements in, in this state, the priest's body was, had not shown even the slightest corruption and it was still totally pliable, totally pliable. So after that event, uh, it's, it's terrible, but the worst elements of, of the town braggadociously named themselves Matacuras. Matacuras, they say we're the Matacuras. In Spanish that means the priest killers. So they took pride in the, in the, in the thing. Well, 37 years later, now remember that date, 37 years. We're going to talk about the significance of that. 37 years later, in 1985, the Navado del Ruiz volcano, which is only 86 kilometers from Armero, began to smoke. Now this, this volcano had been dormant for 150 years. Scientists knew that it was about to erupt again. But the uh, officials of the city would not allow the city to be evacuated. They went on the radio, they kept reassuring people, don't worry, nothing's going to happen, you'll be fine. Well, on the evening of November 12th, the town mayor broadcast one of these messages assuring the people safety. Stay in your houses, don't be, don't be afraid. The next day, the volcano began to erupt violently. Uh, the Lugunilla River, which flows through the valley beneath the volcano, had been choked up for two months and there had been a big lake that had formed because of it being choked, uh, choked up. And when the eruption started to take place, it started to dump volcanic ash and gravel into this lake. And the lake turned into a type of concrete mixture. Shortly after that, the volcano blew a huge rock right into the center of that lake, which created a mega tsunami that reached 300 miles per hour coming down the river. Remember, this isn't water, this is concrete. And it literally buried the city with all of its inhabitants under that. Nothing was left. The whole city was des destroyed. The morning after the eruption, a civil defense pilot flying over the area was recorded saying, and I quote, my God, Armero has been erased from the map, close quote. From the beginning of the eruption to the point when the city was absolutely destroyed was 15 minutes. It was so fast they didn't even have a chance to get reports of the disaster out. They found out of the disaster, about the disaster because dead bodies started floating down the river and reaching the next town downriver. Um, very curiously, there was only one section of the city that was not destroyed. And it, this section of the city was a farm that was situated on an island in the middle of the river and the elevation of this island was lower than that of 
the city of Armero, and yet it was totally untouched. Physically, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, a good Catholic family lived on that island. Right at the point of the island, pointing downstream, they had a statue of Our Lady of Fatima. Even more interestingly, that was the family that had gone, collected the priest, and given it proper burial. The property was totally <laughs> So that's, a, that's very beautiful. It's another example of chastisements that God does bring to the earth. There's only one more historic example I want to give. And this is one of the greatest examples of divine chastisement in history because it was predicted by our Lord himself. It's the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Now there are two different times in the Gospels uh, when our Lord talks about this, this chastisement. Uh, both of them are in the Gospel of St. Luke. The first one from, the cha from chapter 19 reads, And when he drew near, seeing the city, he wept over it, saying, If thou also hadst known, and that in this thy day the things that are thy peace, but now they are hidden from thy eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, and thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and straighten thee on every side, and beat thee flat to the ground, and thy children who are in thee. And they shall not leave in thee a stone upon a stone, because thou hast not known the time of thy visitation. Our Lord spoke about it again in chapter 21 of St. Luke. And when you see Jerusalem compassed about with an army, then know that the desolation thereof is at hand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst thereof depart out, and those who are in the countries not to enter into it. For these are the days of vengeance, chastisement, that all things may be fulfilled that are written. But woe to them that are with child and give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captives into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trotted down by the Gentiles till the times of the nations be fulfilled. Our Lord made these prophecies in the year 33 A.D. And Jerusalem was destroyed in the year 70 A.D. If we subtract 33 from 70, we come up with 37 years. It's an exact model of what took place in Armero. Obviously, it was not our Lord Jesus Christ who was killed in the streets of Armero to warrant the chastisement. It was his representative, a priest, who was killed. There's a perfect correlation between the two things. Now before the chastisement, the destruction of Jerusalem took place, there were many signs over that city. Uh, and, and all of these details I'm giving to you come from a historian named Josephus, who was not even a Catholic. One of the signs was in the star there was a fiery sword that was visible to everyone standing over the city for a full year before it. Like a Similar, comet? What's that? Like a comet? It was some kind of, yeah, celestial thing, but it, took the, it looked like a fiery sword, whatever it actually was, uh, as anybody's guess. But that's what it looked like. Uh, in the middle of the city, there was a man named Joshua who was parading through the streets nonstop for seven years before this. And all he was doing is screaming out, Woe to Jerusalem! Woe to Jerusalem! The authorities captured him and started to beat him to make him be quiet. Instead of screaming out in pain, he just kept repeating, woe to Jerusalem, woe to Jerusalem. When they released him, he went back and did the same thing. Years later, they beat him again so violently that there were sections of his bone visible. And he continually, he never screamed out in pain, continually kept repeating, woe to Jerusalem, woe to Jerusalem. The Romans finally came to besiege the city and he climbed up on the walls and once again shouted, Woe to Jerusalem! But this time, this fellow Joshua added, And woe to me as well. And as soon as he said that, a rock from one of the siege engines of the Romans struck him, and he died. Well, the story of the city's destruction is, is very impressive. Uh, even before the Romans began their siege, there was a, a civil war taking place within Jerusalem. There were three factions. Uh, one of the factions had installed itself inside the temple. So pilgrims going to the temple were being slaughtered in the crossfire of what was taking place. It was, it was absolute chaos. Um, the conflict inside the city before the Romans came had reached such a pitch 
the people inside Jerusalem were praying for the coming of the Romans because they wanted an end to all the violence. Their prayers were answered and the Romans did come. So the Romans encircled the city, just like our Lord had said, and cut off the supplies. The people started to starve to death. Uh, it became very common for people to be stealing food from each other because there was nothing to eat. Even uh, cannibalism became rampant inside Jerusalem. There are recorded incidents of mothers eating their children. The starvation became so bad. Uh, as the starvation, the infighting, and the Roman bombardment started to take its toll, uh, bodies were accumulating so bad that they didn't even bother to bury them anymore. They were throwing them into the rivers. Uh, this was so terrible that the Roman uh, general Titus, who was in charge of the siege, took one look at Jerusalem, and in front of his men, he called out to heaven and said, God, I want you to be a witness that I am not the source of these terrible things that are taking place in Jerusalem. That's how bad it was when he first came to the city. So they circled the walls of the city. Uh, fierce fighting ensued. The Romans broke in through the three doorways and went throughout the, the, the streets, destroying everything in their paths. Um, the last stronghold they had was the temple because it was a very strong building and it was up on a hill. So everybody fled into the temple. One of the Roman soldiers threw a torch into the temple and it immediately burst into flames. Um, as the Jews fled the, the temple, the Romans were cutting them down as they were trying to escape from the fire so much that they said the whole hill surrounding the, the temple was covered with dead bodies and blood was flowing down the steps of the temple like a torrent. Um, and just one atrocity after another took place. I'm not going to go into all the details. I know we're getting a little bit short on time here. Well, the, after the, the whole thing was finished, uh, the Emperor Titus ordered that everything in the city be razed to the ground except for three of the main towers of the city. He left those standing to be a monument of the greatness of the city of Jerusalem that he had conquered. So literally, in the words of our Lord, not a stone was left upon a stone in Jerusalem. So that is the second part of my talk. The last part is much shorter, um, but I just wanted to emphasize with the second part that divine chastisements do take place. There's historic evidence if you, if you look and you study history. The third point I want to I talk about <clears throat> is all of the revelations in the mystics of the church who have spoken about this coming chastisement that we can, we can expect. And I, I want to emphasize, I only speak about the apparitions that have been totally uh, condoned, totally enforced by, by the church teaching. Because it's very hard to decipher the veracity of an apparition until the church has spoken about it. The church has very competent people that study every aspect of it. So the first uh, approved apparition that I'm going to talk about is the apparition of Our Lady of La Salette. Is anybody here familiar with Our Lady of La Salette? Not many. It's a, it was an apparition that took place in France in 1846. And um, there was two, two children, Melanie and Maximin, who saw uh, the apparitions. And following are some excerpts of what Our Lady told these children would happen. She said, God will strike in an unheard of way. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. God will pour out his wrath, and no one will be able to flee so many accumulated evils. The chiefs and leaders of the people of God have neglected prayer and penance, and the devil has obscured their minds. They have been turned into errant stars which the devil will drag with his tail to perdition. God will allow the old serpent to foment divisions among those who reign in in all societies and in all families. They will suffer physical and moral torments. God will abandon men to themselves and send successive chastisements for more than 35 years. Once again, I, I do think we're in the midst of these chastisements already, so I don't think we have 35 more years. Society is on the verge of the most terrible scourges and paramount events. One must expect to be governed with an iron lash and drink the chalice of God's wrath. It's pretty impressive. Italy will be punished for her ambition to shake off the yoke of the Lord of Lords. 
She will be given over to war. Blood will flow everywhere. Churches will be closed or profaned. Priests and religious will be expelled. They will be delivered to death, cruel death. Many will abandon the faith, and great will be the number of priests and religious who will fall away from religion. Even bishops will be found among them. Bad books will be rife upon the earth, and the spirits of darkness will spread everywhere a universal laxness in everything related to God's service. They will have a huge power over nature. There will be churches to worship these spirits, the spirits of nature. You ever hear of Wicca, the Wiccan religion? That's exactly what they do. These evil spirits will transport people and even priests from one place to another, for they did not believe according to the spirit of the gospel, which is a spirit of humility, charity, and zeal for the glory of God. The vicar of my son will have much to suffer, because the church will be given over to great persecutions for a while. It will be a time of darkness, and the church will go through a horrible crisis. The holy faith in God having been forgotten, each individual will want to be his own guide and to be superior to his fellow men. Civil and ecclesiastical powers will be abolished. All order and justice will be trampled underfoot. One will see nothing but homicides, hatred, envy, lies, and discord without the love of country or family. The Holy Father, she's talking about Pope Pius IX now. She spoke a lot about Pope Pius IX. Pope Pius IX will suffer very much. I shall be with him until the end to receive his sacrifice. The evil ones will make various attempts against his life without being able to shorten his days. But neither he nor his successor will see the triumph of the Church of God. The civil authorities will all have the same objective which will amount to abolishing and making disappear every religious principle to make way for materialism, atheism, spiritualism, and all kinds of vice. I think we see this very, very much today. The just will suffer much. Their prayers, penance, and tears will rise up to heaven, and the whole people of God will ask for pardon and mercy, and for my help and intercession. Through an act of his justice and great mercy towards the just, Jesus Christ will order his angels to put to death all of their enemies. All of a sudden, the persecutors of the church of Jesus Christ and all men given over to sin will perish. The earth will become like a desert. Very shocking. Very, very shocking. Scary. Scary. Yeah. Moving on, this is what an Italian mystic, Blessed Anna Maria Taigi, foresaw. And she was speaking in the late 1700s. God will ordain two punishments. One in the form of wars, revolutions, and other evils which will originate on earth. The other will be sent from heaven. Mm -hmm. I think wars, revolutions, and other evils originating on earth, we're, we're experiencing this. Mm -hmm. We're experiencing this. I think it's going to get worse, but we are experiencing this. There shall come over all the earth an intense darkness lasting three days and three nights. Nothing will be visible, and the air will be laden with pestilence, which will claim principally, but not exclusively, the enemies of religion. During this darkness, artificial light will be impossible. Only blessed candles can be lit, lit, lighted and will afford illumination. On this terrible occasion, so many of these wicked men, enemies of his church and of their God, shall be killed by this divine scourge, that their corpses around Rome will be as numerous as the fish which a recent inundation of the Tiber had carried into the city. When she was speaking, there had been a, a terrible flood of the river Tiber and had filled the streets of, of, of her city with dead fish. Uh, all of the enemies of the church, secret as well as known, will perish over the whole earth during that universal darkness, with the exception of some few whom God will soon after convert. The air shall be infected by demons who will appear to, uh, under all sorts of hideous forms. After the three days of darkness, Saints Peter and Paul, having come down from heaven, will preach throughout the world and designate a new pope. A great light will flash from their bodies and will settle upon the cardinal, the future pontiff. Then Christianity will spread throughout the world. Whole nations will join the church. These conversions will be amazing. Uh, concerning this great chastisement that will take place, Blessed Rembort, also in the 17th century, uh, the 1700s, had this to say. 
God will punish the world when men have devised marvelous event inventions that will lead them to forgetting God. What kind of inventions? Technology. They will have horseless carriages and will fly like birds. This is in the 1700s. People thought he was insane. People are going to be flying around in airplanes. But they will laugh at the idea of God, thinking that they're very clever. There will be signs from heaven, but men in their pride will laugh them off. Men will indulge in voluptuousness, and lewd fashions will be seen. Last, I just want to read a little excerpt from Anne de la Foi, because I think it relates very well to what we're seeing today. There will be discord within the church. In those days, men will wear women's clothing, and women will put on men's clothes. It's happening very much. Well, this then finishes the main points that I wanted to cover with you this, this evening. Uh, before I move on to the conclusion, does anybody have any questions? What was the name of the person that um, you listed three se four seers? Right. What was the, the third person's name? The Blessed Rembort, R-E-M-B-O-R-D-T. There's a if, if you wanna if you're interested in the issue, there's a book um, that I believe is published by Tan called The Coming Chastisement, mm -hmm. written by Eve Dupont that that has a wonderful collection of all these. It's a very good good read. Well, in the face of such a uh, perspective of worldwide chastisement, of the wrath of God being leashed, unleashed upon the world, it obviously leaves us with a profound feeling of uneasiness. Like you said, it's scary. Now, on one hand, we want to see the evil forces that dominate the modern world cast out of power. We want to see the triumph of the church. We want to see the reign of Mary, uh, which will come after this chastisement. However, on the other hand, we know that it's very unrealistic to expect that we will go through this punishment unscathed. We ourselves will certainly have to endure hardships, sufferings, and tragedy before we arrive at better days. And that's why I think it's very important to end these considerations with a message of confidence. Confidence is that virtue, it's that super hope uh, in our, our Heavenly Queen that gives us the certainty of victory in the face of seemingly certain defeat. Now in this line, I can think of no better message of confidence to give you than one that the founder of our organization, Professor Plinio Coye de Oliveira, gave after finishing a meeting on the chastisement that he gave in 1990. And with this, I'm going to finish my words this evening. Quote, as bad as the circumstances will be in which we find ourselves during the chastisement, even if we seem lost, even if we seem relegated to the last corners of the earth, there is one era, error we must not com uh, commit. We must not stop confiding. The more we encounter a difficulty, the more we are humbled and dejected. If we confide with a confidence that outweighs our dejection, we can have the certainty that we will be attended. Would you like to measure the size of the victory that will come? It will be proportional to the measure of our humiliation, failure, and apparent inability to obtain anything. It's very beautiful because we feel crushed sometimes. The, to the extent that we're crushed, that the forces of good are crushed, to that extent, good has to reign in the earth again. He finished with these words, the only true defeat for us is if we stop confiding. Thank you very much.